Mark 14 is where we find ourselves in the book of Mark this uh, morning. And interestingly enough, as we walk through the book of Mark heading into Easter, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting that you know, we're coinciding with the, um, with the dates and the times. And it just so happens that even now, uh, Mark 14, where we talk and we read about the, uh, the plot to kill Jesus and, and uh, the, uh, Ju- Judas finally agreeing to betray Jesus, um, we're gearing up to a, a literal Easter message and I, I, again, I have to say this, I've said this before, but I love being able to walk through a book like this because that what the context has shown us is that it's, um, it's not just what happened on the cross, but it's the story of everything that leads up to it. And when you understand the context of the story of how everything has led up to this moment, this incredible moment in history, it makes you look at that moment in history with fresh eyes. A recurring theme in Mark has been these people have sight, but they don't have clarity. And what I feel that God has been doing with us in reading this book and and teaching through the book of Mark is that he's been doing the exact same thing. He's been revealing to us sight that we already had, we, we saw, but now with these details, with the context and with the historicity behind it, we're gaining clarity as to the importance and the significance of all that Jesus came to do and um, every miracle that he performed, every argument that he had with the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, or Herodians, whoever it was, the significance is in there as well. It's just been mind-blowing to see how incredibly important the details are to the whole grand scheme of things. This morning we find ourselves in Luke, uh, Mark, Mark chapter 14, 1 to 11. I'm going to read this for you. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how, that, how they might take him, Jesus, by a trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, that this woman has done, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray Jesus. God, I pray that you use these words to convict our hearts, to convict our spirits, to reveal your uh, truth to us this morning. Use my mouth and use my mind. I submit them to you, my heart. Uh, God, let the words that are coming out of my mouth not be my words, but your words, so that all may be encouraged and challenged, and at the end of the day, none will be seen but you. You're the point. You are everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark has an interesting way of writing, and if you've walked with us through the book of Mark, we would have seen um, a couple things kind of uh, just play out. And and this story here is an example of one of those um, types of teaching strategies that Mark Mark uses. What he uses here is called a Markan triptych. Markan triptych. This is basically something that only Mark does. Read the story. It break, let's break it up into three sections here. The first part, it's the, um, you know, it talks about the chief priests wanting to kill Jesus and seeking how are they going to put him to death. It can't be during the feast lest there be an uproar. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we get this story about this unnamed woman who, in, in later gospels, we, we learn is Mary, the, uh, Mary who is believed to be the sister of Lazarus, um, doing this extravagant thing with the alabaster flask, the 
the oil, anointing, all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, it goes back to, and Judas went out to find this chief priest and said, all right, I'll do it. I'm in. Give me some money. I'll betray Jesus, but I got to find a convenient way to do it. It seems like there's a break in the story. It seems like we're moving somewhere, and all of a sudden, that, you know, that, that whole story of um, Mary and this alabaster flask is just kind of thrown in there. It just does, almost doesn't seem to fit. This is Mark's style of teaching. It's called a Mark, and like I said, a Mark and triptych. It's basically a sandwich. In a sandwich story, you've got the outer layer, you've got the outer layer, and you've got the middle. I call it an Oreo. So in an Oreo, we all know that the point is not the outer cookie. That's okay, but what you really want is you want the double stuff in the center. Like, that's the good stuff right there. Like, that right there, that, without that double stuff, the story doesn't quite, or the cookie doesn't quite have the same meaning, the same impact that it normally would. So a Markan triptych is what um, Mark uses to connect the outer layers with the point being the middle. We'll get to that in just a second, um, because the first thing I want to talk to you about today is, is, is right off the top, we read in verse 1, after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We read a lot in the New Testament about these feasts, right? We hear about them in the Old Testament, we hear about them in the New Testament, uh, but we really, really, I don't know, don't really know a whole lot about what these feasts are, why they're significant to the plot, to the story, why they even partook in these feasts. Was it just an excuse to get together, break bread, and have some fun? Was there more meaning behind these feasts? You could study the feasts, and I encourage you, do study the feasts, because there is great significance behind each and every one of these feasts. Leviticus 23, 1-2 says this. And the Lord spoke to Moses. So we're, we're talking generations, 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 generations. Leviticus 23, 1 to 2 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. So right at the beginning, right off the top here, we see that this is a commandment that the Lord gave Moses to start instituting these feasts feasts. Why? Why? Well, before we go why, let's talk about what feasts are actually being instituted here. So there are seven main feasts. We have the first one we all know, which is the feast of the Passover. We've heard the Passover from the time we were, you know, junior highs to the the day we'll die. Passover is probably the most common one. Second one we hear about is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and then the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. Now, these seven feasts are, are interesting uh, because they existed as a prophetic outline that provided picture after picture of God's entire plan for mankind. At this point, all seven of these feasts were prophetic in nature because none of this had been fulfilled in any way, shape, or form. They were looking to the future, and these feasts all represented prophetic elements as to what to look for, what to expect in the coming Messiah. So the feasts, the first four of them, the Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Weeks, uh, Pentecost, it's all pretty much um, happens um, right up until Acts. So these four are kind of taking place. We have the Passover, which is the lamb, um, which represents Jesus Christ. Then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a feast. You you know, I'm just going to explain it to you. The Passover happened in the first Jewish month called Nisan. Not the car. Nisan. If it helps you think about it, then that's cool. Association's good. But in the first month of Nisan, so for us, that would, the correlating months here for us would be March, April, so springtime. So the Passover feast happened in the month of Nisan, which was the first Jewish month, and Jewish men from all over the world descended upon Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is so crowded at this moment. That's why there's so much going on. They can't, there's like multitudes and multitudes, not that they're just following Jesus. They, there's an expectation because Jesus' name has been getting in. Josephus teaches us that there's perhaps close to three million people descended upon Jerusalem. Three million people in a seven billion person planet is one thing, 
But I have no idea how big the uh, population was back then. But I'm telling you, 3 million people was a lot more than 3 million people today, if that makes sense. So, so you got 3 million people up to at this place, and that's why it's so crowded. Um, and what they would do is they would come to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifice, what we just talked about in communion. This was in remembrance of how God had delivered them out of Egypt. And so on the 10th of Nisan, they would get everything prepared. That's why they're there early. They're not just there for the one day. They're there early because the groups of families would come together. They would buy their, pick out their lambs or bring their lambs with them, prepare their lambs. On the 10th, they would have four days to get everything ready for the 14th, because on the 14th of Nisan, they would, and their family would then take, their fam- uh, take the lamb to the temple and sacrifice it. So that was the feast of Passover. This is why they, it existed. They would then take the sacrificed lamb, leave the blood, they would take the carcass back home, they would cook it up, eat it, feast. Make sense? The second thing we see is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is what was being read here, the two feasts. Um, The Unleavened Bread happened immediately after the Passover on the 15th of Nisan. So you've got Passover on the 14th, and then you've got Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th. That lasted seven days. Total, between the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you've got eight days there total. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Eight days, okay? And so what most people do, what what was very common, they would just lump them together and call the the Feast of the Passover and Unleavened Bread because Passover was really only that one-day event. They would kind of just lump them together and call it one eight-day shot. But that's the, the basics of what happened there. So on the 15th, the Unleavened Bread... Uh, began. And that happened and would last seven days. At this feast, they would put grain in the ground and then they would pray to God to bring the harvest for the coming year. The Hebrews would pray this prayer, God, give us life out of the earth as they put the grain in the ground. And even then, we can begin to start seeing the symbolism that these feasts would have to play in all that Christ was doing. So let me, let me bring it down. So here's the astounding thing. Not only were the feasts meant to be prophetic, but the fulfillment of these feasts in Jesus were absolutely spot on. Like, look at the timing. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, spotless, without blemish, has come, and during the Jewish feast of Passover, Jesus is being sacrificed. This wasn't happenstance. Generations, generations, generations ago, this was a decree set out by God to Moses in Leviticus and said, these are the feasts that you should follow in preparation and prophecy in the prophetic utterance of what's going to happen in the future. There was no man kind of timing this out. This was all God's timing. And it wasn't just happenstance that at the Jewish festival of the Passover, it coincided with Jesus' crucifixion. And if you walk forward, the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they would typically take the grain They would put it in the ground. They would bury it. And the hope would be that as they buried this grain, it would take root and bear new life. That was the hope. That was the prayer. And during this seven month, or seven week, seven day, (laughs) seven day feast, this is their prayer that every single, you know, that God would bring, essentially, bring the harvest. So this is exactly what's happening, and we see this. This is so incredible because as this feast of unleavened bread, Jesus' body was being buried. What do we know about Jesus when he was buried? He took the keys of sin and death, and then that that whole evacuation back to heaven. But we also know that this was symbolic of his presence now being here on earth, his death. A seed has to die before it can bear and bring new life. His death brought new life all throughout the then known world and would continue to move forward. And now, the Feast of First Fruits was a celebration where, where all the first fruits that you would gather together would come and they would you know, take those, those first fruits, everything that had now you just been prayed for, 
the next feast would be the celebration of all these fruits that had just come. You take the first and you offer it back to God as a symbol of sacrifice, as an offering back to him. And, and, and all through this, we see that these feasts, sorry, I'm, I'm rushing through time here because we've got like 10 minutes left, but all through these feasts, we see the gospel present right? We see the gospel present in the lamb and the Passover. We see the gospel present in Jesus being buried to bring forth new life. His resurrection is symbolic of the first fruits because that's the first fruits coming in. Jesus back to new life. So we see all these things coming to play. And then we see the feast of Pentecost weeks. We see that after the fact in Acts, We see all these feasts coming to fruition, and we see the gospel message in these feasts, but what confuses me is in the midst of this time of historic hope, there was so much hate towards Jesus in the outer layers of this story of love in the middle. And in the middle, we see this most incredible expression of love. On the outer, we see these feasts being celebrated, but in the midst of those feasts, they're not getting it. They don't have the clarity, and they're still hating Jesus, wanting to put him to death. And at the bottom of the story, Judas is putting him, literally saying, yes, I will contribute to the plan to put him to death. And now in the middle, there's the story of extravagant, extravagant love. Did you know that this bottle This alabaster flask was made out of stalactites in caves. They would take a chunk of that, they would carve it out. There was no like separating it, hollowing it, and gluing it back. No, no, they would carve, I don't know how they did it, but they'd carve it out. And they did it in such a way that it was a slow flow. So the perfume got in, but it was a slow flow out. This bottle of perfume was so extravagant that they couldn't even get the perfume at their own location. They had to ship it in from India. You think purulator's expensive. I don't even know what they had. They had like cane boats back then. Just like, you know, the, the, the cane boats. You, you know what those are. <laughs> and, the, and, and that's what they had to use back then to, to, to ship this stuff in. This perfume in this extravagant alabaster bottle was worth, it says, somewhere around 300 denarii or so. That's basically a year's salary. Now, I want you to follow the heart here. This lady, Mary, who is the brother of Lazarus, who was Lazarus? Lazarus was the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. Mary was the, uh, was the woman who Jesus released like six or seven demons from. Her love towards Jesus and what he had done for her was beyond anything that she could ever comprehend. So the only way for her to show tribute to his love Not payback. See that? Notice the words coming out of my mouth. The only way for her to pay tribute and to to reciprocate her love towards Jesus was to give him the best thing that she owned. And I'm telling you, that was the best thing that anyone could have owned in those days. Typically, they were used for burial, so you hold on to that. She was almost sacrificing her, 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 her retirement for that. And she doesn't just take that alabaster bottle and sprinkle it on Jesus and try and like, you know, everyone's got those bottles, you're trying to shake them out, nothing comes out. She snapped it. She destroyed the bottle. It would never be able to hold poor perfume again because it didn't have crazy glue back then. So that perfume bottle was literally destroyed. It was utterly demolished. She took this most extravagant gift that was so over the top, but to her it was fitting. It was fitting because of what Jesus had done for her already. The the, the fact that he had saved her, removed all, you know, cast the demons out of her. And then when Lazarus was dead, not dying, but when he was already dead, he should have been smelly by this point. When he was in the grave, Jesus said, he's just having a snooze. It's okay. And pulled him out, raised Lazarus from the dead. Her love Her appreciation, her devotion to Jesus was everything that this, this gift was all she had, but it was the best that she had to give him. You see, what happens in this story is we have this exchange of money going on on the outer layers. 
You see that exchange happening? The, the, the scribes, they're, they're, they're all, you know, they're, so, so the scribes, for those of you that don't know, and, and last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about the, uh, the, um, the widow with the two mites. She too gave all that she had to give. But the compare and contrast in this story is absolutely mind-blowing because the two mites that she had was all that she had left because the scribes had taken everything from her. They had tricked her. They had demonized her. They had told her that in order for salvation, you have to give everything that you've got. And so her now without anything the, the food that she has, the money that she has to buy food, to pay, to, to live for the rest of the week, she takes that money and gives it to the temple treasury in fear of losing salvation. Th that wasn't a tithing story. We talked about this. This wasn't a, a, a story of extravagant love. This was a story of extreme manipulation by the scribes of the day. It was a story of extreme manipulation that took advantage of the people that God's heart were so for the widows and the orphans. And the compare and contrast here is that there was nothing, there was nothing tying Mary to this bottle. There was no manipulation going on. When she recognized, when she saw with clarity what Christ had done for her and potentially what he was going to do for all of humanity, it wasn't even, it was a how much more can I give you? It was a, this is all I've got, but I'm going to with abandon, recklessly break it and smash it and pour it all over you because my love for you is beyond anything that I can even comprehend at this moment. It's a love that goes beyond bounds. One commentator puts it like this. Mary didn't just pour out a few drops of ointment on Jesus. She poured out all of the contents. Her love was not calculated, but it was extravagant. This probably represented all of Mary's life savings and retirement package tied up together in one. Those who are in love with Jesus and are overflowing with gratitude to him sometimes do some strange things. At least outwardly they appear strange. Mary loved the Lord. Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. He had been there during some of the most difficult times of her life, and certainly one was when her brother Lazarus died. But Jesus had come, and her brother Lazarus was miraculously raised from the dead and given back to her. Her response was true extravagance. It was true worship. And when the disciples probably likely, it would have been Judas chiming in there as well, when they kind of chided her for that, Jesus said, uh-uh. Uh-uh, you're missing out on something. You're missing out on something. Because Christianity can't just be about the doing. You see, in other stories, we read about Mary and Martha. Mary is sitting there while Martha is, you know, busybody. You know, not busybody. Wrong word. Busy doing stuff in the kitchen, uh, busy, you know, cleaning. She's just doing all that kind of housework stuff while Jesus is there and Mary is sitting here. And Jesus chides Martha and says, hey, Martha, ho, 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 hold up. Hold up, take a few moments. I'm not always going to be here, but my presence is here right now. My presence is here. Don't sacrifice doing for me when you're missing out on my presence first. And there's this idea of, uh, 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 of being able, Mary, to dwell in the presence of God. You're always going to have these things around, but take every opportunity to sit at his feet. Take every opportunity to pour out your heart, your love and affection for him because Jesus didn't die for a program. He didn't die for an event. He died for a relationship. He died to save our souls from sin so that he could ultimately have relationship with each and every one of us. And what Mary was doing right now was she was reciprocating that same relationship. And it's completely different. It's completely different from the manipulation that the poor widow with the two mites experienced. And then we see why the story is placed in the middle. It's because in these next few verses, we see Jesus, Judas agreeing to ultimately betray Jesus for what? 30 pieces of silver three to four months worth of wages. 
What a contrast of hate and love. Judas, one of the 12, hates Jesus and sells him out for money. But Mary, who loves Jesus and spends a whole year's wages on him without batting an eye. Matthew 6, 21 says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. You know, I love our times together in worship. And I don't want to talk about this in a physical context because, you know, that, that, that's something I leave with you. You know, God has given us all stuff and it's our responsibility to give back to him. But the minute you start giving back to God out of guilt, you revert back to what the widow with two mites was doing. God's heart for us, God's heart for you, is to be able to give to him out of love, out of reciprocation, out of honor. It's a, it's a giving that for, for me, you know, when I see my kids, you know, I, I, would, I bought them a fish tank this week. And uh, actually, I won it at the Cuba thing and then, you know, bought the fish and all that kind of stuff. But I spent good money on that. I also spent good money on the cake. But anyways, um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that. For me, it wasn't even a thing. It was, I love, I, I love my kids. I promised them a pet. And this is the best pet that I can get them because I... <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting into manipulation here. My bad. Back off. <laughs> but for me, doing that for my kids, showing love for them it, it is, is a no-brainer. But when we take that same attitude and we give it to Christ, sometimes it doesn't. It's not so easy. It's not so much of a no-brainer. It becomes something that's so challenging. It's like, well, I don't want to give to God. I don't want to give him my time. I don't want to give him my talents. I don't want to give him my money, my resources. I don't want to do any of that. I, it's, oh man, why can't I just keep it? Because nothing is yours. Everything that you have is a gift from God. And when we understand that, and the greatest gift that he's given us is salvation, then oh my goodness, it's like we, we stand before him and we're like, God, just take it all. Just take it all. Take it all. Like Mary had nothing to fall back on. We don't know if Mary was married or not. We don't know that. There's, there's thoughts around that. But she just gave away her whole life inheritance, if you want to call it that. She gave away her whole, um, uh, all of her, her, her resources, any hope for retirement, anything like that, because it was a very male-dominated society back then. The men provided for the women. They took care of them. And if you, were, if you were left without that, then you had to provide for yourself and care for yourself, but you couldn't really get a job as well because it was a very male-dominated society back then. So we take someone like a woman who presumably was not attached or married to, to, uh, to, another, uh, to a man. So at this stage of the game, we look at her, and what, what do we see? She, she, she gave up her security. I'm not saying you guys need to do that. <laughs> I'm just saying, look at that love. Look at that love. And then what does Judas do? He sells Jesus out. He sells his own Savior out. And even at the, at the, the last supper ta table, he knows he's going to do this. And Jesus knows he's going to do this. And he says, do what you must do. And Judas is like, is it I? Like, are you kidding me? Is it I? For 30 pieces of silver for like, I don't know what that equates to nowadays, like 15 or so, 20 grand thereabouts. For 20 grand, he gives up Jesus who walked with him every single day. Can you, the love of money will destroy you. The love of money, be, being able to take everything that you collect, everything that you have, and everything that you want in the physical realm and hold to that, that will ultimately destroy you. If you hold so tightly to that, there will be no room to hold on to anything else. But what she did was she loosed her grip on her security, and she gave it to Jesus, every last bit of it, not because she had to, not because she felt manipulated to, but because it was a reciprocation of her love towards Jesus. She loved him that much. And he hated him that much. I leave you with this, for where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. So my friends, store up your treasures in heaven. Take full advantage of the presence of God. Dwell in his presence daily. Take communion daily, hourly, if you need to. If you have kids like me, you probably need to every hour. It's just one of them, one of them deals. And learn to dwell in his presence. Because as we learn to dwell in his presence, that love relationship will grow deeper and deeper and wider and wider. And the treasures that you'll be storing up will be in heaven, not on earth. Father in heaven, give us that desire and that discipline within each and every one of us to store up treasures, not here on earth, but in heaven. To not let that earthly you know, desire to gain wealth control us, but to allow our desires, the only desires that control us to be relationship in, in your presence, to let everything that we do stem from a place of submission to you, stem from a heart of extreme love to you. You know, we, we may not be at the point right now where we're willing to, you know, cash in and check out, you know, all in case for you, but and I don't think you're calling us to that. I think all you're calling us to do right now is just to take some steps forward and deepen that love relationship that we have with you. For you died not to restore a program, but to restore a relationship. And God, I pray that we get that today, that we will learn to dwell in your presence, learn to listen to your Holy Spirit, and learn to listen to that soft nudging inside. We love you, Jesus. Give us a great day. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you that spring is here, and we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen and amen.